Welcome, welcome everyone to this special webinar event in collaboration with Pendulum and Fullscript. I'm Amy Regan from Pendulum, uh, from Fullscript, excuse me. I'm so excited to have them here. I'm from Fullscript and I'm so glad that you've enjoyed, you've joined us today. A few housekeeping notes, please place all questions you have in the Q&A box for a chance for them to be answered during the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent via email to all attendees and registrants. And there's a copy of the presentation slides in the handout section. Today, we are so lucky to have three presenters all in collaboration. We have Colleen Cutliff, the Chief Executive Officer of Pendulum, Dr. Alex Keller, Medical Director here at Fullscript, and Dr. Jeff Glad, the Chief Medical Officer also here from Fullscript. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll we're going to kick it off and get right into it here. And here's a quick overview of what to expect today. Dr. Glad and I are going to do a quick run through of metabolic syndrome and, and the gut metabolism access just to prime uh, Dr. Cutliffe to give us the, the meat of the presentation, which is to talk about these unique strains and the impact that they have on metabolic health. We're also going to talk a little bit about the history of Pendulum, the mission of Pendulum, and where we're going with the field of acromancia and these unique strains. And then we'll talk about some protocols that you can use in your practice today, right away using Fullscript. And then we'll end off with a live Q&A. So stick around for that. I will say just one housekeeping note here that the purpose of having Dr. Glad and I here is not just to give you a quick intro and wrap it up at the end. It's to act as facilitators of this conversation to make it feel more like a conversation and less like a presentation. So feel free to drop questions in the chat or in the, the question box, and we will ask those questions as we go. We want this to feel a little bit more like a podcast combined with a webinar where Dr. Cutliffe will be showing you the content of the slides. So don't hesitate to ask questions and participate in the conversation with us. So with that, I'll pass it to Dr. Glad, and we'll get going. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. So as he said, in order to set the stage for the rest of the webinar and, and what Colleen's gonna dive into, I wanna do a quick review of metabolic syndrome in general. So as many of you know, metabolic syndrome is defined as having at least three of the following characteristics. Visceral adiposity, which is measured by waist circumference, elevated blood pressure, low levels of HDL cholesterol, elevated triglycerides, or an elevated fasting serum glucose. The greatest concern it is really the impact that it has on health and longevity, increasing the relative risk of depression, death from both coronary heart disease as well as cerebrovascular disease, and an overall increased relative risk of mortality by 40%. Those last three stats come from a 2004 prospective study that followed 7,000 people for about 13 years. Now, at the time of that study, you know, 20 years ago, metabolic syndrome impacted 24% of the U.S. population. That number now is one in three. So the reason many of us are practicing whole person medicine today and are tuned into this webinar is because metabolic syndrome and its associated conditions, they're preventable. I also have seen you know, a lot of patients now coming in with understanding of this condition and its risks focused on screening and creating a plan to be as proactive as possible. So let's touch on some of those tools that are in the treatment plans for addressing metabolic disorders. The list we've built here spans natural therapies to address blood sugar control, lipid abnormalities, blood pressure. I'm not gonna read each product here. You have access to the slides and many of you probably know this list already, but do wanna point out that the evidence supporting their presence here is plentiful within the full script resources, as well as our treatment protocols on the platform. We've also provided some of the common pharmaceuticals that are being used for your patients but really wanna focus on the bottom right side of the screen. Diet and lifestyle modification is obviously foundational and something we're all typically leading with our patients in, in discussing and guiding. And I don't think it's any surprise that the microbiome has always played a critical role in focusing on metabolic health as well. And, and at least for me, that concept has seemed quite general over the years, just sort of improve the microbiome. But now, as you'll see the rest of the webinar, we have clinical data and products that can help us specifically target metabolic health at the microbiome level. Oops. 
So a quick overview or just a summary here of the gut metabolism access. This is a, a relatively new concept in terms of the interplay between gut health and metabolic health. Now, I think in our space, if you practice root cause medicine, you would know that there's obvious connections that already exist based on our understanding of, of the gut and the metabolites that are formed and, and the impacts that those have on our, our overall metabolism and our overall health. But I thought I'd check the, the internet of things to see what's the current perspective on the gut metabolome access or the gut metabolism access. And so where do we go now to get a summary of the internet of things? We go to ChatGPT, of course. And what did ChatGPT say? The concept of the gut, gut metabolism access is not widely established or specifically defined as of April 2023. However, the gut metabolome would likely refer to the array of metabolites produced by gut microbiota and, to, and their interactions with the host metabolism. In this context, the gut metabolome access might imply the relationship and interactions between the gut microbiome, its met, met, metabolic products, and the host's physiologic systems. So I think that's a really nice description, but the reason why I'm calling that out is it's becoming mainstream knowledge now that there is this interplay between the gut and our metabolism. And what's highlighted on this slide is that we now know that there are there's an unfavorable gut microbiota, so a balance of the microbiome, and the, the overall metabolites produced by that that has led to various metabolic diseases. Acromantia municipiola, in particular, is lower in individuals with high body weight, uh, body mass indexes, cholesterol levels, and fasting blood glucose levels. So you can see that there's correlations there um, with a, an imbalance of acromantia in particular. We also now know that there's pro-inflammatory bacteria found in higher abundance in individuals with multiple metabolic disorders. So to set the stage here for what Dr. Cutliffe is going to talk to now, there's very clear evidence now pointing to the fact that if there's an imbalance in the microbiome, it can directly impact our metabolism. And it's now more broadly known that the digestive health of our systems can also have direct impact on our metabolism. So let's pass it over to Dr. Cutliffe and she will fill in the gaps from here. Thank you guys. And uh, thanks so much for having me on and uh, the really nice tee up about uh, metabolic syndrome and its uh, importance. I like that we started with the all the dire stats around how terrible it is, but then the hopeful slide of all the different opportunities to help people uh, improve their metabolic health. Um, so I uh, agree that there's been a lot of a belief that the microbiome is an opportunity to target health, but the evidence uh, continues to grow. And so I'm really thankful to get the opportunity to share with you guys the evidence and some of the mechanisms of actions that are kind of happening in the gut metabolism axis. So I'm going to start with the data, which I think is the part that people all want to know is what is this thing actually doing for the body? And then we'll get into uh, the key strains that are performing these functions and um, what their mechanisms of action are. So um, one of the primary studies that we refer to is this double-blinded placebo-controlled um, uh, randomized trial in which we looked at people with type 2 diabetes and uh, tested interventions that target the microbiome to look at what the outcomes were for their disease state. And so the details of this, um, of the trial design, are that it was a 12-week uh, study in which everyone wa was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Um, they were in the early stage, meaning that they were either you know, just on metformin or just recently diagnosed. Um, and there were three arms in this study. One was the placebo arm. Um, and then we tested two different formulations. One is called WBF11 that con contains a five-strain formulation. Um, and we'll get into more details of what's in that formulation. And then the other was WBF10, which was a subset of WBF11. So WBF11 has five strains, WBF10 had three strains. And this was uh, done across 76 subjects um, and, and six study sites. Uh, and there were 58 subjects analyzed per protocol analysis. Um, and really the primary outcomes we were looking for are were safety and tolerability. These are strains that are novel. They don't exist on the market today. And so we needed to make sure that there was safety and tolerability um, being measured. We also looked at uh, 
uh, a few key measurements of metabolic syndrome, including the area under the curve after a meal tolerance test, as well as the hemoglobin A1C levels. And then we also looked at C-reactive protein. Um, and so uh, this is just table showing the uh, um, demographics of the intent to treat in the PER protocol, where you can see that three arms were balanced. Um, and the key outcomes here are, are highlighted on the right-hand side uh, on A1C, uh, as well as area under the curve after a meal tolerance test. And so um, what you can see is on uh, both of these graphs, the placebo arm is in gray, the five-strain formulation is in green, and the um, three-strain, the subset formulation was in blue. And for both A1C and area in the curve, we see a statistically significant improvement um, in both A1C and uh, blood glucose spikes. Um, and the uh, A1C difference between placebo and the five-strain formulation was a drop of 0.6 over this 12-week period. And then we were able to see that people who were on the five-strain formulation were able to lower their postprandial glucose spikes by 33% compared to placebo. And so we also were able to look at uh, both the total area under the curve as well as the incremental area under the curve. And so on the left-hand side here, sort of a cartoon of what these two look like um, or sort of what these two measurements are. So essentially um, the uh, line there is showing the uh, postprandial glucose measurements after the person has taken the meal tolerance test. Um, and because the starting fasting glucose level in this particular case is just under 200, uh, there are two measurements here. One would be the total area under the curve, um, and that would be everything under that curve. And the other would be the incremental area under the curve, which would take into account uh, their, their starting uh, glucose levels and sort of eliminate that dark blue part underneath there. And really what you can see is that whether you measure the total area under the curve or the incremental area under the curve, in both cases, you see a statistical and clinically significant improvement in people who were on the five-strain formulation. Um, we did see some improvement on the three-strain formulation, but it's certainly not as large as the five-strain formulation. Um, to further follow up on the study, we also measured the presence of the strains. And so what you can see on the left-hand side here are the five strains um, and the different arms. And, and these are taken over the course of four time points. Um, and so what you can see is that uh, during the intervention period, which was the 12-week period, that these strains go up in the different formulations. And then we also did a four-week washout period. And so you can see that after washout, the level of the strains goes down. Um, we also measured uh, the presence of short-chain fatty acids, and I'll get into the mechanism of action later, but one of the uh, hypotheses was that we could increase butyrate production. And what you can see is that in both stool and plasma, we were able to see the increase in butyrate levels um, in the five-strain formulation. And so the way that these uh, work is really kind of highlighted in this, this overview. And so I know this slide has a lot on it, so I'll try to take us through this uh, in a um, organized fashion. So first of all, in the, on the left-hand side, uh, there is a blue box um, that has a list of all the strains. And so um, the strain that we'll actually do a little bit more of a deep dive on is Acromancia mucinophila. This is a mucin fortifier, uh, as well as stimulates um, L cells to produce GLP-1. We'll go into that data in a second. Uh, there are also butyrate producers, Clostridium butyricum, Clostridium bejerinki, and Anaerobutyricum halai. Um, and then there was a primary fermenter, and this is basically a you know strain that can generate the um, the predecessors to butyrate production, and that's Bifidobacterium infantis. So if you look at this image at the very top, uh, where the person is ingesting this pill, um, there is the, uh, the the pill contains all of these strains, plus uh, it also has a little bit of inulin in it. Um, and so what the mechanism of action of this product is um, is sort of twofold. So the first is that these strains can act together in order to metabolize fiber into short-chain fatty acids. And particularly, we're really interested in the production of butyrate. Uh, butyrate, as many of you guys know, has a long-standing history with tons of literature about its health benefits, not only for colon health, but also for metabolic health. Um, and, and one of the reasons why butyrate is so important um, in this metabolism story is that butyrate is able to bind to receptors uh, in these L cells and stimulate GLP-1 production. And GLP-1, uh, as many people know, is a really important small molecule in metabolic syndrome, uh, recently gaining maybe a little bit of infamy uh, through products like Ozempic and Wagovi. 
but essentially those are mimics of the naturally occurring GLP-1. Um, and what we know is that when you are able to stimulate GLP-1 to the proper levels, um, that helps you with your insulin secretion, insulin sensitivity, um, also very importantly helps to improve satiety and so um, helps people uh, to kind of reduce the food noise um, through a variety of mechanisms. And so it plays a really important role in helping people manage their metabolic syndrome. Beyond the production of butyrate, the other really important role of this formulation is in this mucin layer. So um, I often talk about our uh, gut lining, sort of like a wooden fence where uh, you have all these planks that are held together by glue. What can happen to a wooden fence over time and through wear and tear and seasons is that that glue can start to become thin. Those planks can start to fall. Our gut lining is exactly the same. You can see there are these um, endothelial cells here, which are basically the planks. And the glue is this mucin layer, which is represented in blue here. And acromancia um, mucinophila is the only strain known to date whose role it is to regulate that mucin layer. And it does it in a very comprehensive way in that it can both consume mucin as it's getting old, as well as stimulate goblet cells to produce mucin when it's needed. And so um, we'll get into what happens when you're low or missing acromancia, but um, acromancia not only uh, produces the short chain fatty acid propionate, but also has this really important role in the gut lining. Um, and so it's really the formulation of these five strains that led to that efficacy in terms of A1C and blood glucose spikes. So before we get into acromancia, um, I don't know if there's any questions we want to address from the Q&A. Um, and I, I, I think I can address the one about do these strains colonize. Um, one of the interesting things that we looked at was the presence of the strains during the intervention as well as after a four-week washout period. And what we found is that for the vast majority of people, when they're not taking the strains for 30 days, um, the strains actually disappear from their stool. Uh, except for about 15% of them did maintain the strains. And so, um, you know, we asked people not to change their diet or their lifestyle or anything through the course of the study. Uh, but of course, we don't have control over whether people maybe increased their, their, their fiber intake or did things to help these strains colonize more. But it does appear that uh, for some population, the strains can colonize and sort of independently um, continue to grow even without taking the, the pills. And we definitely know that if you're able to um, increase dietary fiber as well as, as well as polyphenols, those have been shown to increase acromancia levels in people without even needing to take the probiotics. So colonization is definitely a possibility. Yeah, I think there's another related question here too. Um, acromancia in increasing the mucin layer, does it also have a direct impact on secretor uh, secretory IgA as well? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to, to IgA in particular. Definitely there are, is a, a, a fair amount of literature showing the role of acromancia and how it uh, functions with both the immune as well as the inflammatory response. I don't know if you guys have seen some of that data. I'm not familiar, no. No, neither am I. Um, Another one that came in here, actually, there's two questions that are related is, um, is there any risk for hypoglycemia if you take too much of this, this combination? And is there any concern if someone's already taking a GLP-1 injection like Ozempic? Um, so hypo, hypoglycemia um, is not something that we've seen reported in any of the clinical trials that, that we or other people have run. Um, but, but I guess I could never say like that's never a risk, uh, but, but we just haven't seen it. And I think the fact is that the microbiome is a sort of complex ecosystem of all these different strains. And so we're introducing these strains into an existing ecosystem. So, you know, in, in some cases you could imagine being able to overrun the microbiome or overrun the body with certain things. But in this case, if it's a you know, healthy person or a person with metabolic syndrome that has a healthy microbiome, you know, more or less, uh, it would be hard for one strain to come in and totally take over that microbiome. So I think there, the risk is uh, relatively low on those side effects. On the on the GLP-1 drugs, um, I think that, uh, you know, I'll also say that we haven't done any trials of, of kind of what the 
potential additive effects would be of enabling your microbiome to produce GLP-1 while also injecting the GLP-1 drugs. But I would just say mechanistically, they work um, slightly differently. So uh, the, the way in which the microbiome stimulates GLP-1 production is that you, you consume food, the microbiome metabolizes that food, it stimulates your body's natural GLP-1 production. So GLP-1 goes up in the bloodstream, uh, signals for insulin release and metabolizing the glucose in your blood, also signals for satiety so that you're not hungry anymore. And then it, it actually goes down until your next meal. And so you kind of have this, this rhythm of, of GLP-1. Um, in contrast, the GLP-1 drugs are injected directly into the bloodstream. They are chemical analogs of GLP-1. So they're, they don't kind of have this up and down. They sort of maintain in your bloodstream at a high level. Um, and that, and to a large degree, that's why they're so effective. There's just this almost like loudspeaker effect of metabolism of glucose as well as satiety. And I think we're going to learn a lot over time about, you know, what are the side effects uh, and the longer term repercussions of having that constant really high signal. But since they're acting through two different mechanisms, and one is a chemical and one is your body's natural GLP-1, I think it's worth uh, stating that, you know, it's possible these two things can, can work together. Awesome. Let's carry on because I know you have a lot of slides to get through. Thank you. Okay. And I'll, I'll try to do the, 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 the full script uh, way of presenting here where I don't linger too long or give extraneous information. All right. So um, Acromanthi mucinophila is one of the uh, most important strains that has come out of microbiome science. It's really emerging as a keystone strain for metabolic health. Um, as I said, it lives in the mucosal layer. Um, it helps to minimize gut permeability. And it actually represents a pretty substantial portion of a healthy gut microbiome, uh, really in the one to 3% range, you know, even potentially as high as five to 10%. And so it, it is important and it's also in, in large abundance in a healthy person or healthy, I'll put in quotes. Um, one of the important things about acromancy to note is that there was almost nothing known about it before 2010. And so this is a relatively novel strain, but what you can see is there's exponential growth in the studies that are being done on acromancy and the publications that are coming out. And moreover, you can see that acromancy appears to be playing a role in a wide variety of conditions. Each of the colors in this bar graph represents a different disease state or different health state. And so acromancia is being called a keystone strain because it seems to play a role across a broad uh, uh, spectrum of different health conditions. And so one of the first things that was discovered about acromancy is it's linked with obesity. So this is from the American Gut Project that was done over 10,000 participants ranging from 20 to 99 years of age. And what came out of this study was really a broad understanding of what the microbiome looks like across different body parts and in different people. And that acromancy really uh, kind of percolated at the top of people's interest here because uh, it appeared to be um, inversely correlated with BMI. In other words, independent of your age, your sex, whether you smoke, whether you're a drinker, your diet, and your country, it appears that if you have uh, high levels of acromancia that was associated with low BMI, and conversely, high BMI was associated with low levels of acromancia. So then people started to start to understand, is this just a correlation or is there actually more to this? Um, and another sort of correlative uh, follow-on study to that was really looking at the um, the impact of diet and, and what acromancia looks like there. So uh, everybody knows someone who uh, goes on a diet uh, and they appear to lose a ton of weight. And then people who go on a diet and appear to lose no weight. And one of the questions is why is that? Assuming people are adhering to their, you know, their, their nutrition plan, why is it that one person should be able to lose more weight than the other person? And the microbiome appears to be one of those potential unlocks. And so what they did in this study was they took a bunch of people, they put them all on the same diet. So you know, high fiber, uh, calorie restricted diet. Um, and then they looked at their starting microbiome and particularly they were looking at their starting acromancia levels. And then they asked the question, is that correlated to how people responded to diet? And the answer is yes. So if you started with higher levels of acromancia, you actually, through this diet, had better results in terms of fasting blood glucose, triglyceride levels, and body fat distribution. And so this was another kind of indicator that maybe uh, the acromancia strain is involved in our ability to metabolize foods. 
And this is a really like important hallmark study that was done on acromancia showing that acromancia plays a role in, in boosting and, and stimulating GLP-1 production. So on the left-hand side here, um, the y-axis is the, um, the GLP-1 levels. And what you can see is they sort of compare a placebo to uh, acromancia, which in this case, they've named it SNUG61027, <laughs> so it's a particular strain they're looking at here. And what you can see is that when they um, add a uh, snug, they are able to see the stimulation of GLP-1 compared to the, the placebo, which is just another strain. And then these uh, investigators actually did a, a further investigation, which is, you know, what um, is the potential protein that is stimulating GLP-1? And so on the right-hand panel here, you can see that they looked at nine different proteins, um, and they showed that this protein called P9, this is a protein that's secreted by acromancia, is able to stimulate GLP-1 production. And so this is, I think, one of the most exciting advancements in the field of microbiome science, where you have this direct uh, stimulation of GLP-1 production by a protein that's now been identified that's secreted by acromancia. Um, this has been repeated and also uh, shown in dose response curves. Um, you can actually see from imaging the ability of these cells to stimulate, uh, sort of the ability of acromancy to stimulate these cells to uh, produce GLP-1. And there's some early data suggesting that uh, it might also be able to stimulate PYY. So that is uh, something to keep a lookout for, and hopefully more data will come out from various investigators on that role. And so this is kind of a summary cartoon of what we know about acromancia to date. Um, so on the left-hand side here uh, is really the accumulation of probably a decade worth of data uh, that's been generated around the world. Um, and what it shows is that acromancia has three really important roles um, that result in uh, important health outcomes. So uh, acromancia is able to, we'll start on the left-hand side here, it has a surface protein called AMUC 1100 that is able to bind to these TLR2 receptors and uh, is important for stimulating gut barrier integrity as well as immune homeostasis, and that's through the IL-10 pathway. Um, it is also able to produce propionate, which binds, which uh, is converted to butyrate, and that binds to these G protein coupled receptors in the L cells, and that stimulates GLP-1 production. And uh, acromancy is able to secrete P9, which binds to these ICAM2 receptors that also stimulates GLP-1 production. Um, and GLP-1 is important for weight management as well as blood glucose control. So what happens when you don't have any acromancy around? Well, you have this thinning mucin layer, um, which leads to these loss of tight junctions. And so many people refer to this as sort of um, leaky gut. Uh, and it really is the, these, these holes that are created in your gut lining. Um, and so as a result of that, you get intestinal inflammation, you can get the infiltration of pathogenic bacteria and reduce gut barrier function. And then of course, without acromancia and all of these small molecules that it's either generating or on its surface, um, you don't get the stimulation of GLP-1. And so um, just to kind of address also the difference between live acromancia and pasteurized acromancia, um, pasteurized acromancia is a, 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 a version of acromancia in which you pasteurize it through heat. Um, and so what this effectively does is it, um, uh, it, it kills the strain, so it's no longer alive, um, but it has some of the components of acromancia still available uh, in there. And so when you compare uh, what the benefits are of live acromancia versus pasteurized acromancia, it's really only the live acromancia that's able to interact with and regulate the mucin layer because, again, the live acromancia consumes the mucin uh, as well as it stimulates goblet production of new mucin. Um, and then only really the live acromancy can interact with prebiotics. And so when we think about the fact that uh, fibers and polyphenols are able to increase acromancia um, through the diet, uh, that, that cannot be achieved through pasteurized acromancia. Um, what pasteurized acromancia does have is some of the small molecules. Um, it's been shown that uh, there is some AMUC 1100 uh, that is still there. And so there's probably um, the ability for uh, that small molecule to potentially interact with the TLR2 receptors, but certainly um, the pasteurized form doesn't have all of the activities of the live acromancia. And just to address the colonization question that someone asked earlier, uh, a pasteurized version could never really colonize in the gut. 
Um, so we'll kind of quickly go through some of the other strains that are in here because I think acromancy has sort of emerged as people's favorite strain, but anaerobutyricum uh, li is also a very important strain, produces butyrate, has anti-inflammatory properties, um, and is in low levels uh, uh, for people with type 2 diabetes and may increase GLP-1 levels through butyrate production. Um, the studies that have been done uh, in, in, with anaerobutyricum li have been mostly mouse studies outside of the one that I showed you where it's part of the formulation. Um, and what people have been able to show is that um, administration of this strain uh, is able to lower blood glucose spikes. Um, and then also that what this strain is able to do is to convert lactate and acetate, which are other short chain fatty acids, um, into butyrate. And so it's able to increase butyrate levels through that mechanism. Clostridium bejerinca and Clostridium butyricum are two also really important strains in the formulation. They are butyrate producers. Uh, many people may have heard of um, Clostridium difficile, which has a very negative connotation. It is a, a pathogenic bacteria when it gets too high in levels, but these are good clostridial strains here. Um, they're found in humans, but also they're found in soil and water. Uh, they also support GLP-1 production. Um, and uh, just to reiterate that uh, butyrate is a really important small molecule, and low levels of butyrate have been associated with a wide variety of diseases, including metabolic syndrome. Um, and uh, there's been a fair amount of work done on Clostridium butyricum, uh, actually even just based on its name, uh, it's a butyrate producer. Um, and so we know a fair amount about its ability to not only produce butyrate, but to also have the impact of increasing GLP-1 secretion. And actually, uh, as of today, January 16th, 2023, uh, there are only two strains that have ever been published to show that they can stimulate GLP-1 production. One is uh, Acromancia mucinophila and the other is Clostridium butyricum. Um, and then the last strain is Bifidobacterium infantis. This is a, a much more widely studied and widely known strain. It's been around for a while. Um, it is a primary fermenter and is able to produce acetate and lactate. Those are also two really important uh, short chain fatty acids. Um, and it's an important strain in the infant gut and developing the immune system and also plays an important role in metabolic syndrome. I don't know if you guys wanna uh, break and do some questions here. Oops. You're on mute, Alex. So, I mean, yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I, I, no, I think a couple that, that sort of fit um, from that section. So more on the, maybe some, one is a, can too much acromantia damage the gut lining? And then also sort of a ask to comment on the potential increased risk of acromantia and a connection to MS, Parkinson's, and potentially other autoimmune conditions. Yeah, these are great questions. And I'll start with the caveat, which is I showed that slide. We, we This is a relatively new strain, and so we're still learning a lot about its role, and, and uh, particularly in these you know, very specific diseases. So there hasn't been a demonstration that um, increasing acromancia can cause uh, some of these different diseases or that increasing acromancia has adverse um, effects. That doesn't mean that that will never be shown. It just hasn't been shown to date. What has been shown is that there's a correlation, uh, and actually I should say that this, this data is, um, there, there's contradiction, contradictory data on this, but there have been some publications showing that um, uh, autoimmune diseases, you know, like MS, uh, have been correlated with higher levels of acromancia. Um, and there was a super interesting study that came out of the Cox and um, Weiner labs over at Harvard, where they demonstrated that they could um, take acromancia and put it into an MS model in mice and actually um, improve the symptoms of MS. And so one of the current hypotheses is that um, you see higher levels of acromancia in these disease states because somehow the body is able to upregulate acromancia, which is playing an important role in actually fighting the diseases. So akin to some of these inflammatory um, and immune markers that you see where when people have these disease states, you see elevated levels in the bloodstream. And it's actually an indication of what your body is doing to try to be protective um, as opposed to causing the disease. But again, you know, very early in the research there. And I think there's a lot more to, to uncover it and acromancia's role in those disease states. There's another one that came in regarding uh, diabetes type one and the ability to re re reduce the reliance on insulin in DM1. Is, is there any studies or research on that to date? Um, we have not done any trials on type 1 diabetes. Um, we do have customers who have shared with us their CGM data from being on the product. Um, and all I would say is that, you know, mechanistically, 
um, they are, the, these GLP-1 drugs, which are used for type 2 diabetes, are also used in type 1 diabetes. And so um, I think it's not totally clear how that's working. But uh, if you believe that stimulating GLP-1 can help in type 1 diabetes, this would be a, a natural way to, to tackle that. Awesome. Let's take a few more, eh, Jeff? Otherwise, they're all going to be piled at the end. Yeah, no, again, yeah, this is the most, this is the most q and I've ever seen in a webinar. Uh, so that, again, a tribute to, to how um, exciting this is. Uh, so this one is, um, as it increases, there's a couple questions about biofilms and the potential interaction of supplementing and biofilms would, you know, d does it protect, does it worsen, you know, if, if you have a patient, you know, who has a concern around dysbiosis and biofilms, a any thoughts? I don't know if there's any evidence on, you know, would you stage that therapy or, or how might you think about that? Yeah, um, I am actually have not seen any data to date really talking about the interaction between biofilms and the mucin layer, but um, I think that's a, a really important question. And so um, maybe that's something that if anybody wants to follow up with our team on, we'd love to hear people's experiences with, with that and, and thinking about that and any data you have. Um, because I think we're going to learn a lot more about that. And, and certainly, I think one of the important things about biofilms is, you know, how it maybe enables or doesn't enable certain strains to colonize. And so um, I think it's a very interesting angle. Okay. Yeah, I mean, many of them, I'm just looking through here, a lot of them are related to uh, the association to GLP-1 and, um, you know, whether you can use them together, if, you're having any interactions, any concerns like that? Um, Maybe I'll add, I'll, I'll kind of address that at a high level. So, I mean, again, we haven't done a study with uh, GLP-1s and our products, but we do have um, customers that are on both of these in a few different contexts. You know, one is that they're on both of these and others that maybe they're trying to titrate and figure out what's optimal for them. You know, one thing is because of the way that the GLP-1 drugs work, where they're maintaining very high levels of GLP-1 um, all the time, you know, you see a very immediate and dramatic impact of being on those drugs. I mean, some people talk about just hours later, they're already experiencing benefit from it. That is not uh, likely to happen with a microbiome intervention because what you're doing here is you're introducing a new microbe into an ecosystem. You're asking it to get a foothold there and then to start to um, uh, um, metabolize foods and stimulate GLP-1. But most importantly, the way your body naturally produces GLP-1 is you get a spike in GLP-1 and then it goes down. So it will never have kind of the same signaling effect as something that is kind of being hammered at a high level all the time. So um, it's sort of the, the curse of the natural way of doing things, uh, but also the benefit, which is that, you know, the curse is that you're not going to see such an immediate impact. The benefit is though that you won't ne necessarily get all those, those side effects, but then also you're basically teaching your body to fish. You're giving your body the strains that it ought to naturally have and is you know, lost along the way for a variety of reasons um, and enabling your body to actually do the thing that, that it's supposed to be doing. And so um, it may not feel as immediately rewarding, but I think if you're looking for a natural way to help your body stimulate GLP-1, um, that, that this is the, the path to use. Um, I also know that one of the things that's coming out around GLP-1s, two of the, the side effects that are really being talked about are the um, kind of reduction in, in muscle mass. And so uh, when you naturally stimulate GLP-1 and you have this rhythm to it where you go up and down, that's unlikely to happen. And then moreover, um, the, the GI distress that, that can come with having you know, really high levels of GLP-1 all the time. Um, you know, is we, we, we actually have people reporting improved GI. And so some people are actually trying to take the two together in order to counter the, the GI, um, the negative GI impacts of being on the drug, because essentially what these high levels uh, of this drug can do is to kind of slow gastric emptying. And so for some people that shows up as kind of really bad constipation. And so they're looking for a way to improve the regulation of that through the microbiome. So first of all, you, you just nailed Alex's favorite analogy by talking about teaching someone how to fish. So well done there. Um, what, one more question and then, and then we'll move on. I thought Dan Wasserman had a great question. Okay. What is the main cause or driver for decreasing acromancia over time? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think one of the most well-studied reasons is because you're not feeding it. And so essentially we know that the, pre the role of prebiotics is super important in maintaining these strains viability 
uh, they're living inside of you and completely dependent on what you decide to feed them. And so um, we know that if you have a low fiber diet or you're a low polyphenol diet, that you have reduction in acromancia. And conversely, you can increase acromancia levels through increasing dietary fiber and increasing polyphenol consumption. Um, but some of the other things that have been associated with lower lowering your acromancia levels are things that we don't really have very much control over, although some might argue they don't have control over their diet. Um, but we know that as we age, we start to lose acromancia. We know that when we go through periods of intense stress, um, we can start to lose acromancia. We know that women, when we go through menopause, um, we lose diversity in multiple strains, including acromancia. And so there are a, and, and actually we know also the circadian rhythm can affect it. So when you travel and night becomes day and day becomes night, that can cause you to become depleted in acromancia. So there are a bunch of things that are just part of being a human being and living that can cause us to lose acromancia. And that's why you start to see this becoming more and more prevalent in people who are starting to age and that the low acromancia levels are associated with such a wide variety of diseases. And so um, I think that, you know, to before being able to uh, manufacture and sell live acromancia, the only way to increase it was really to increase, you know, change your diet. So increase your dietary fibers and polyphenols. And so now we have a, a direct way to um, give it back to people. And, uh, you know, depending on how they lost it, you may or may not be able to rectify that. Okay, let's, let's okay. wrap it up here. And then we've got lots of time for Q&A at the end because there's plenty of questions still coming in. All right, great. Um, so uh, just real quick on the, the history and the mission of Pendulum. Um, we are really here to restore your body's natural capabilities. Um, I will let everyone here imagine what is in those cups and what is being uh, given to people's microbiomes in this image, but it's all good stuff meant for mental health and gut microbiome health. Polyphenols. Um, <laughs> what? Polyphenols. Polyphenols, exactly. Um, uh, we have uh, been founded by three scientists. I'm one of them. Uh, Jim and John are the other co-founders. And then um, we actually recently, last week, made the announcement that uh, Dr. Perlman has joined as our chief medical officer. Prior to that, it was Dr. Orville Coulterman. And so um, he is really a type 2 diabetes expert. And Dr. Perlman comes to us from the Mayo Clinic uh, as the most recently director of integrative health and well-being there. And he was at Duke prior to that. Super excited to have him here. And hopefully, uh, we'll be working with Fullscript more deeply as he gets onboarded. Um, we, as a company, have really been centered in data. We've actually been around for about 10 years, and it started with trying to map the gut microbiome and all the different pathways and figuring out how they interact with each other and can help with human health. Um, we realized that the strains that we were really interested in are have this uh, uh, profile of being these strict anaerobic strains. And so when we think about the gut microbiome on the left-hand side here, um, we're really talking about the distal colon area where there's no oxygen there. And so being able to grow these strains is, is actually um, not as straightforward as one might hope uh, because they can't grow in the presence of any oxygen. It also means that measuring their viability um, has to be done in multiple ways, including the traditional colony forming unit where you kind of spread the um, strains on a petri dish and you measure how many colonies are able to form, but also using a flow cytometry to measure viability. Um, this is a much more quantitative uh, and comprehensive way to look at what's in your product. So here in green, it, first of all, every one of those dots would be the equivalent of a colony um, on the right-hand side. So you get a lot of data points. The green are the viable cells the um, and the, the red are the uh, dead cells. And then you can see there are cells kind of on the cusp that are in between live and dead. And so um, in trying to assess what's actually in your pill and making sure that it's consistent from pill to pill, it matters how much live stuff and how much dead stuff is in there. So these active fraction units from flow cytometry are a really important measurement tool. Um, and so we really had to identify not only the target strains and the prebiotics that are paired with them, but rule out toxins and antibiotic resistance, um, really isolate these strains, uh, have the ability to grow them and perform animal and human uh, safety and toxicity studies. This is um, one of the reasons why you haven't seen a lot of new strains enter the market. And you're probably going to have a hard time finding new strains that enter the market because it's a lot of work to demonstrate safety, which is, of course, the most important thing when we're introducing these. Um, and, and this is going to be necessary for us to really capitalize on the, on the treasure trove of the gut microbiome. 
Um, additionally, it's been really important uh, for us uh, to make sure that the um, latest and greatest technologies are used that maintain the viability of the cells um, that are in the pills. And so we are um, uh, launching a line that has uh, these desiccant lined bottles. And this is the exclusive line that we are talking about with full script. Um, and, and really the difference between a desiccant lined bottle and, and sort of the traditional way that this is managed. Sorry, maybe I should take a step back. The reason that desiccant is so important is because these strains are freeze dried. They're in a powder format in the, in the capsules. Um, and when they're exposed to moisture, that causes them to revive. And now all of a sudden they're sensitive to oxygen and they die. So you really want to keep moisture away from all of the strains. And and so um, one way to do this is to have kind of these desiccant packets. All of us have seen that in our foods and in and many bottles. On the left-hand side here, that blue thing is a desiccant packet. And you can see that depending on how close the pill is to that desiccant packet, it may or may not be getting the benefits of that. In contrast, the desiccant line bottles have desiccant lining throughout the whole outside of the bottle. And so it really allows a more even uh, um, uh, trapping of moisture and also keeps moisture from even entering the bottle. So it's a really important technology if you uh, care about maintaining the viability of the strains. Um, we, the, we have been um, uh, funded by the Mayo Clinic. We're actually the only probiotics company out there that's been uh, invested in by the Mayo Clinic. The rest are all therapeutics companies. They are routinely using acromancy in clinical practice. Um, Dr. Mark Hyman brought acromancy to the Cleveland Clinic, and they've also been using acromancy in patient care. Um, and so uh, happy to connect people with any of the investigators there to understand how they're using these products in their um, worlds. And then lastly, kind of the really big challenge for Pendulum right now is how do we continue to educate everybody um, and build awareness of these novel strains and what the benefits are that are coming out of them. And so we're really appreciative to Fullscript for recognizing the importance of education and allowing us to come in and talk about um, the data and the mechanism of action from these different strains. Um, we, you can also find us being talked about uh, from a few different people who are also really uh, invested in education from Dr. Hyman to Dr. Atia uh, to Dr. Fitzgerald um, to even Halle Berry. Is it, is it Dr. Halle Berry yet? <laughs> so I think she's been a, uh, yes, what do you call that when you kind of get a doctorate uh, just by um, your yeah, experience? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so, Go ahead. So, so we want to wrap up spending a little time on Fullscript as your platform for treatment planning with ingredients like this and specific you know, specifically how it pertains to metabolic health. I mean, Alex and I have been a part of the team for, for several years now, and, and really a big focus in the last couple of years, along with the medical advisory team and collaborating with our partnership team is added focus into working with brands that have end product clinical validation so that you can rely on prescribing treatment plans for your patients that are gonna have the most you know, likelihood of, of positive clinical outcomes. And it's also, you know, working with companies that have had quality improvements, like the innovative packaging Dr. Cutcliffe mentioned, um, you know, and we're working also to collaborate and protect these practitioner brands. That way we can ensure that patients have the most clinically effective products through you, their practitioner. So we want to spend a little bit of time and get into one of our evidence-based protocols and have Dr. Keller talk about what his team has done in terms of metabolic health. Super. Thanks again, Dr. Cutliffe. Fantastic overview. I will plug quickly because you just mentioned it, the Peter Atia podcast that you were on recently. Check that out, everyone. It's a fantastic overview, similar to what you just heard, but a slightly different overview regarding acromancia. It's also a great one to share with patients if they're looking for additional details on why you might be prescribing acromancia. So, what we do at Fullscript is we, as Jeff just mentioned, we, we try to pull in partners that are bringing the, the most innovative and best products to the market and educate you about how to use those. We also try to educate you on the ingredients that are effective in practice and that contain evidence. And so what we've done is assimilate 40 different ingredient-based protocols that are not necessarily in combination evidence-based, but each individual strain is evidence-based. And in this case, we've now made a unique protocol that includes the combination of strains that you just heard about, along with other nutrients that have shown to be beneficial in regulating blood sugar and in acting as support for 
conditions like metabolic syndrome. So these are meant to be templates. You can modify these. They're not set in stone. You can change them as you like. They're also meant to be educational. So you can browse through the full script catalog of, of protocols and templates and learn about these ingredients and then mix and match and apply them as you like. But we put this one together in particular because it's a great starting point to use the combination that you just heard about along with these other ingredients that are complementary to a treatment plan that may address metabolic syndrome. You can scan the QR code at the top there and that'll automatically upload that template to your account. You can also search by these strains in your catalog to be able to find the associated products. And there's only one that contains these five strains in combination. And finally, uh, if you would like to learn more, we've set up landing pages on both the Emerson and Fullscript uh, marketing sites where you have uh, all the information about Pendulum, Acromancia, and the combination products. If you scan these QR codes, it'll take you directly there, learn more about it, and start putting what you've just learned directly into practice. What, what Jeff and I like to say whenever we do these educational experiences, ideally, you're putting this into practice on Monday morning or in other words, as soon as possible. We wanna make our education as practical as possible and be able to take it so that you can start using it right away. So we hope we've been able to deliver that. And Dr. Cutliff, thank you again for joining us and, and presenting on this. Before you go, there's about 50 questions that we still need to address. We're not gonna get through all of them, but for those that we don't get through, what we now do is we, we capture all of them and then we answer them after the fact and send them to you as part of the follow-up. So. For those of you who we can't answer right now, we will get to them after. Don't fear. But uh, also, thank you again to everyone for submitting your questions. As Jeff mentioned earlier, this has been the most engagement we've ever seen. So it speaks to the topic, speaks to the speaker, and hopefully speaks to the audience as well. So Jeff, why don't you jump right into it and, and ask a few here. I think we've got a, a good 10 minutes still that we can ask some questions. Yeah, so I'm try trying to combine you know several that have the same theme um, and kind of knock out several at the same time. So sort of the, the, this is more about dosing and taking acromancia. So, you know, speak to any contraindication around dosing acromancia with or without digestive enzymes, should we consider timing? And then also there are some questions around, you know, how is it making it through the digestive tract? And a specific question around, you know, how do you consider this with someone who may have had their colon removed? Wow, these are great questions. Uh, okay, let me try to tackle what I can and uh, be clear where I don't know the answer. Um, so uh, first of all, I love the idea that the education here is intended to help people kind of immediately know what to do and put these into practice. And so um, when we think about the different acromancy levels, one of the things that's very unique about this pro lineup is you'll notice there's acromancy 100 and acromancy of 500. And that is specifically uh, for HCPs. This is not available to consumers. And the reason is because um, as a uh, HCP, you have the um, ability to decide about dosing. And so to answer the dosing question, um, some practitioners, so just to be clear, Acromancy 100 and Acromancy 500 are just the pure Acromancy strain. They're not a formulation. So it's just the one strain. So the reason you might want to give someone that strain is because you are a minimalist. You just want to give the minimum vi viable thing to see if it's going to help your patient uh, improve their symptoms. Or it might be that your suspicion is that it's just that they're low in Acromancia levels. And uh, that by increasing that, that's going to help them. Or you've taken a gut microbiome test and that's telling you that they're just low in Acromancia and so that's why you're giving just acromancia back. Some practitioners want to uh, increase acromancia levels uh, kind of almost as a replenishment. And in that case, they use the high acromancy, so acromancia 500, because they're really trying to replenish the acromancia levels and then potentially move people down to a lower level or use dietary change to help maintain uh, colonization of acromancia. Alternatively, there are some people who are really have really sensitive GI systems, and so you don't want to introduce all of a sudden a large bolus of this strain, and that's what Acromancia 100 is for. And so um, people have been, uh, uh, pr uh, practitioners have been asking us uh, for both of these. I want a higher level of Acromancia, and I also want a low level of Acromancia. And so the low level is used in those situations where you're trying to slowly step someone into having Acromancia. So you might start them with the Acromancia 100 and then move them up to 500 or again, start them with 100 and then just use dietary change to help the, the strain colonize. Um, these get through the digestive tract because the encapsulation that we use um, has an enteric uh, component to it, which 
which helps it get through the stomach acid and has a time release component to it, which allows it to uh, get all the way to the distal colon before disintegrating. And so um, that's how that enables the delivery. And of course, we have measurements showing that uh, in this format, you get delivery of the strains to the gut microbiome. Did I answer, did I get to the questions? Yeah, I think the only one was, you know, if a patient ha has had a, their colon removed, I mean, is, is there a role for acromancia in that in that circumstance? Yeah, um, it's a, it's a great question and and an interesting one because actually the beginnings of acromancia come from uh, bariatric surgery. So uh, actually, the doctor who discovered acromancia in the first place, uh, Dr. Lee Kaplan, who's at Harvard MGH. Uh, is actually a bariatric surgeon. And so um, as he was trying to understand, you know, what's actually happening for people in the context of bariatric surgery, he observed that, uh, you know, they were, um, that, that acromancia is a strain that could be delivered and help people improve their metabolism. Uh, actually, at that time, he was doing it in animal models. But um, so I think the idea is that you may still reap benefit, but I think the mechanism is really, really not well understood. Another question came in here regarding pre and post stool testing. Um, we haven't really talked much about how to track the changes over time. You talked earlier about what could be decreasing the amount of acromancia in the, in the in the gut, but how are we able to track what the impact is and, and if you need to be able to increase your acromancia if it's low to begin with? Yeah, gut microbiome tests are becoming, you know, more and more popularized, uh, and, and there are more and more companies that are offering a variety of gut microbiome tests. Um, they kind of fall into one of two categories. One is using DNA sequencing, and the other is using qPCR. And just at a high level, DNA sequencing is sort of like looking at a forest and saying, what are all the different, what's all the different foliage in this forest? And qPCR is a quantitative way to say, how many four leaf clovers are in this forest? And so depending on the question you're asking, you know, you would use those two different tools. Um, I, I think because these are mostly um, consumer gut microbiome tests uh, and they're relatively new, there's not a lot of oversight in sensitivity and specificity and controls. And so it can be a little tricky uh, for, for you to decide which one to use. Also, people's microbiomes change. And so getting longitudinal data on a person will also be important. That it's not that they just you know, uh, came back from Thailand and so their microbiome looks really different than it normally looks. So you'll wanna get longitudinal data the test that we found is the most quantitative for measuring acromancia levels um, is the GI MAP test. Um, and that one uses qPCR to measure acromancia. Um, it can only be gotten through a practitioner, so a, a consumer can't just go get that on their own. Um, but it does a good job if you're trying to understand the changes in acromancia levels. That, that's a great test for that. Yeah, no, that's a great, yeah, great topic. That's um... mm -hmm. So shifting a little bit, there are a couple questions around research on acromancia and other conditions that, that aren't necessarily metabolic. Examples here, celiac disease, other malabsorption concerns, which I think you touched on in some of the cartoons showing the potential connection to leaky gut, food allergies, psori psoriasis, maybe other autoimmune and inflammatory conditions. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how many studies are coming out showing that low levels of acromancy are inversely correlated with these diseases. And I think there's a reasonable case to be made around its role in things like um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome through the gut lining mechanism. Um, the skin one is super interesting. And I mean, we definitely have dermatologists that are using acromancia with their patients to help reduce the, the, the hypothesis is it helps to reduce the inflammation that's associated with things like psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. And so we really are at the beginning stages of understanding, you know, A, how important is the gut lining? And when it is compromised, what are all the different, you know, negative outcomes of that? And then B, you know, if you replenish someone with acromancia, can you repair the gut lining in all of these different case scenarios and therefore, you know, help people improve their disease state? Um, and I think, you know, we highly encourage people, if you've got a hypothesis around it, to really try and see because we are at the early stages of discovery and everyone would like to understand are there certain you know, cases where it's too far gone and, and just supplementing with this doesn't help replenish the gut lining? Or is it true that in the vast majority of cases, um, you can actually reverse some of the, the detriment to the gut lining through these, these microbiome interventions? Um, 
I'm also seeing a bunch of questions of, around uh, the pro line, and I don't know if you want us to go into that. I, just to reiterate, you know, um, the pro line uh, versus the consumer line um, is is primarily in the the dosing and the desiccant line bottles. So, sort of, I, I don't want to say the consumer product is a low quality product, but I would say that the packaging is higher quality for the pro line um, and is only available on full script. And then the other um, thing is that acromancia is a single strain. So if you believe that you're just trying to increase acromancia levels, you would use that. Um, but the data that I showed early on on the intervention for type 2 diabetes um, is pendulum glucose control. So that has the five strains which are involved in the metabolism of fiber and butyrate as well as containing acromancia. So um, just to be clear about the data that I showed was with the, the formulation that is pendulum glucose control. All right, pressure's on, Dr. Keller, the, the oh, last well, question. There's so many good ones. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna ask one because it, I find it comes up all the time. Um, how can acromancia be used in a situation where you have potentially bacterial overgrowth, like in SIBO or similar? Uh, are there any concerns? Has there been any evidence that shows that it's beneficial and or non-beneficial or harmful? Anything that you know there? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start with a caveat that we haven't done any clinical trials in SIBO, and I don't know of any published clinical trials in SIBO. Um, but but certainly, um, I think there's a reasonable amount of evidence, evidence pointing to the gut lining as being problematic uh, for patients that are suffering from SIBO. And so being able to replenish the gut lining um, and, and that mucin regulation is probably uh, if, if I were in Vegas, I would put some odds down that that's going to come out uh, as important there. Um, I do think it is, those are really sensitive situations where, you know, giving more of a consortia of strains and trying to redevelop and reestablish the ecosystem um, through both these probiotic interventions as well as through diet are probably um, a, a better way to tackle than kind of a single strain. That being said, we definitely do have uh, both practitioners and consumers who have been using the acromancia strain for um, SIBO, and they've shared out uh, beneficial results, also have seen beneficial results with uh, both pendulum glucose control and metabolic daily. Um, so I think there is a potential there, but we don't have, I haven't seen any clinical studies around it. Great answer, though, overall. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I guess it's for us to wrap up, hey? unfortunately. Um, I know we're at time here. Here's Amy. She Maybe <laughs> before, before, because I think I'll probably, I just want to thank um, uh, everybody at Fullscript for enabling this collaboration and really creating a high bar for quality and data. Um, and we're we're just really excited to get to work with you guys and, and bring this education to everybody. And a huge thank you to everybody who participated on this call. I love the questions. I wish we had another two hours to answer all of them. Please, you know, reach out to all of us to ask them. We, we want to get them addressed. And um, just thank you for the engagement and the opportunity to, to share this data out. I'll yeah, mention it's incredible. Yeah, completely agree. And, and I'll mention again that we will be taking the remaining questions and answering those sending those out after the fact. If you look in the chat here before we, we sign out, um, it was posted in the chat, a, an email address where you can ask questions directly to the Pendulum team. So if you have any direct questions and you wanna get a fast answer, you can do that as well. Pass it over to you, Amy. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank you so much to everyone who attended today. And thank you so much to Colleen, Alex and Jeff for this great presentation. Everyone look out for their email, which will have a link to view this recording and also a special offer for Pendulum on the products that we discussed. Anyone who has any additional questions can send them to me at amy.regan, that's A-M-Y dot R-E-G-A-N at fullscript.com. And I hope everyone enjoyed this presentation as much as I did and has a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now.